Hi, Amelia. Thank you so much for sharing a cup of tea with me today. <laughs> How are you doing? Good, thank you. Yes, this is a, a lovely moment to have a little catch up and a chin wag. <laughs> so, Amelia, you have a fascinating role. You are, and I'll try not to fluff it, you are the Director of Brand and Innovation Strategy for 1HQ, which, and, and I heard your uh, webinar uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, which I thought was fascinating because you come in, um, you do all the secret sauce, that, you know, the real magic stuff. We come in afterwards with some transformation and, and all the delivery um, aspect for, for our clients. But I'm very, I'm, I'm really certain that a lot of clients would lo love to understand a little bit more about what you do. Um, so, Amelia, how do you, how do you become um, an innovation strategist? You know, you don't just arrive there, do you? How, what, what was your journey to, to that? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I always wanted to be a consultant when I was little, as they say, or, or when I was studying to be a student, because I always thought that meant you got to do this sort of really interesting thinking bit. But in order to get there, I started off with an experimental psychology degree. Then I spent a number of years treading the board doing quantitative research, then qualitative research. And then I learned this thing called semiotics, which was really understanding the subconscious cultural drivers behind why people want them. And um, all of that meant that a number of the projects that I worked on, the question was often, what, what was next? Why do, what do we do with this? And so I then moved to an agency that really specialised in this brand consultancy, which is, so now we've understood all of those needs. What, what do we do? How do we shape them into platforms and opportunities? And so, yeah, that was, it's really just a journey over about 25 years um, of uh, listening to uh, lots of uh, good things that, that brands have done, lots of bad things that brands have done, and watching out and observing all the little bear traps and pitfalls that people go through to get there. So, yeah, a lot of years of experience, I guess, plus a little bit of skills training. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, I know, you, I know you do, you don't just specialise within technology. There's other brands you work with. Obviously, we're, we're a technology company. But um, in, the, in the presentation um, the other day, you talked about what worked, what didn't work across multiple brands, etc., and your involvement in them as well. You know, could you, could you give us some highlights from that, you know, for a few minutes? Would that be okay? Yeah. Yeah, and, and a lot of the, um, the bear traps and the sort of paradoxes of innovation actually work across all sectors. The, the problems that, that come up are, are often the same. Um, for example, we often are asked questions like, uh, when we come up with a really new interesting innovation platform for a brand, clients will often ask us, can you give me an example of another brand that's done this in our sector? Well, the problem with breakthrough innovation is, of course, ideally, it's not something that you're copying. It's new and different. So often there we have to pull in examples of how this need is delivered in another similar parallel category. So that's one of the really interesting ways to work is to looking outside of your category. And the more you do that, the, the more helpful it can be. Um, the, the other um, paradox that you often have is that in order to create really new, exciting innovation, um, you actually want to uh, spend a little bit of money, redirect investment. And that can be quite hard because quite often you're feeling the need to innovate because you're losing market share to another competitor, which might mean that you know, money is tight. So again, it's quite, you have to be quite brave to make some of the best innovation choices. And, um, and sometimes you have to make dichotomous decisions. I remember one of my favorite ones was when we were helping British Airways come up with their sleeper service proposition and how to deliver it um, on that overnight flight. But it's mainly about coming back from America over the Atlantic. And uh, the question in order to frame the like final delivery of the service that we asked in one of our questionnaires to check if it was going to work was, would you rather that there was a trolley serving you food down the aisles 
or it was peace and quiet in the cabin so that you could get to sleep with the lights off. And so I remember the client said to us, no, you can't ask them that either or question because they won't like it. And I said, but the problem is that is the question because you either make it quiet, which is what all of our qualitative research said they wanted, or you deliver a full three course slap up dinner with champagne in business class. This was all about business class. So eventually we persuaded them to have this either or question. And of course, the majority wanted the quiet because on a five hour flight overnight, you don't want to eat because you're going to have to wake up. But sometimes you have to ask the tough, the tough questions, I guess, is uh, one of the things that we've learned along the way. Um, and often there's some bear traps as well. But you're, you're, you're helping. Um, you're typically helping pretty, uh, you know, corporate, you know, significant corporates to innovate to bring out new products etc and that there's a lot of complexities around that and and that's not easy no that's true and you do you are trying to find um this sort of road to nirvana or um the damascus sorry uh, moment where you discover something that nobody else has discovered yet and the problem with that is that um of course, that makes it very hard and clever and difficult. But actually, a lot of um, work that's been written on creativity says that really it is about finding um, other really good uh, examples and applying them into your sector and seeing what's happening elsewhere rather than being myopic and just focusing in on what's happening in, in your sector at the time. So, for example, um, one of our sort of favourite bear trap case studies, um, I used to work years ago with um, Nokia and uh, we were asked to ask consumers what it is that they wanted with mobile phones. And of course, as Henry Ford famously once said, if I'd have asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And all the research came back from the Nokia handset research saying we want prettier coloured um, backs, we want uh, more resilient, tougher screens that don't break, and we want longer battery life. So Nokia focused all of their innovation on this area. And of course, it, it didn't help them um, when iPhone came along and, and stole all of their market le leadership overnight. So one really needs to look outside at um, what's happening in terms of tech trends. Quite often the furthest out innovations come from looking at what is becoming possible in science and technology and often one of the places we start um, first is looking at those more innovative trends um, and possibilities and what tech is able to achieve that it hasn't done before. The other bear trap that we come across all the time particularly in the tech, tech area as well actually um, is uh, new featureitis as it's sometimes called um, and the famous uh, case study was where um, there was the uh, Mac razor that uh, had two blades and then there was a spoof done on Saturday Night Live that, you know, three blades because you'll believe anything. And of course, actually, in the end, Gillette did uh, end up making a five blade razor called the Fusion and even the Fusion Power, which was um, given uh, a, it was an electric version which completely cannibalized their own um, target customers and they had to sort of beg them to trade up to this rather than growing their category. So quite often the other thing to do is not look at what your factory line can do and how to fill it, which is also one of the things that commonly happens, but to actually look outside at those wider needs. So that's one of our top tips is do keep focusing in on what the cultural needs are that are happening in society and how this is changing. And then what does your brand offer or your product offer that fits those needs? And finally, look at your capabilities and how easy those are to adapt. But it's better to start off with bigger platform ideas and then work out how we can start to deliver to them over time and create a longer term pipeline. Um, and that's what we spend most of our time doing is thinking up uh, these more unique platforms that uh, you can use to differentiate. Okay, no, thank you. Um, 
I mean, yeah, I know it's a, it's, it's a super complex area. I mean, where would you say you've had, is, it, is, is there a nice example you have of where you've had success helping to steer a company's innovation? And also on the opposite side, where, is it, where does it, you know, where have you seen things not work so well? Yeah, um, I'll give you a, a really good example of one of my favourites, which I'll go outside of tech for this because everybody's um, heard about food. So I remember once working um, with bird's eye on the fish finger. Now, this was a classic example of, um, of we've got capability and we need you to use that as an innovation idea, which was that they had lots of a fish called the pollock and very little of the fish, well-known fish called cod, because at the time the North Sea fish stocks were very endangered. But consumers in all of the research said, no, I want an 100% cod fish finger. And you're not allowed to offer me anything else because that's the best and that's why I buy bird's eye. But what was really interesting was we then had a little look at what are all the attributes of the pollock fish compared to the uh, cod. Of course, one of the negative attributes was nobody wants to eat something called pollock because it rhymes with other things. And so the first thing that we learned was probably don't blaze in the front of the pack with the word pollock. Um, but we looked at the fact that it was more sustainable, um, that it was just as tasty as the cod. In fact, almost indiscernible, you know, blind taste test, you can't spot the difference. Um, and uh, uh, we then talked about like where it was sourced and that it was part of the cod family, things like that. Um, but the one thing that we also discovered that consumers really liked was it was higher in omega-3 than the codfish finger. And so you, you might think, well, what you need to do is say pollock fish finger higher in omega-3. Problem with that is that consumers read pollock before they get to the omega-3 and they're still not buying it because they still want their cod. But most of the time, customers, consumers, whatever you want to call them, don't read packs properly. This is another thing I learned as a psychologist. Um, most people don't read all the information. When I've worked on mobile phones and other tech categories, they, um, they never uh, spot that you've taken words off. So if you actually write 100% fish fillet and you actually name it the 100% omega-3 fish fillet, they forget to read that it hasn't got cod on it. And they don't even ask the question, well, what's the fish type? They just go, it's omega-3. That's really healthy. That's one of those superfoods that we all want our children to have more of. So if I buy them the omega-3 fish finger, I'm being a really good mum. And in fact, what we worked by doing some choice modelling is we learned that they would be prepared to pay more for the omega-3 fish finger than the cod fish finger. So that's just an example of how it's all about the positioning and the proposition. It's not necessarily about the product. But um, to give another, sorry, I've got, a, I was just thinking of just sort of another tech example um, where we worked with, um, this is a little bit more, uh, uh, newer so I'll I'll keep the client name out but a well-known tech company um, across the globe was looking at the retail experience that they offered in their premium stores compared to some of the others and of course when you ask consumers what's the best example of a premium tech offering they all go Apple and they all say yep yeah, if I want to if I wanted to invent the best premium experience it's got to be like the Apple store. Now that's what happens if you do consumer research because again you're asking them about faster horses. You're not being able to innovate something new and different there. So what we did was we did some semiotic safaris around the world in places like New York and Shanghai to look at the different experiences emerging and what were some of the new and more unique hooks, sign codes and symbols, as we call them in semiotics, that would create a different premium experience to Apple. And um, what we discovered was, and you can see this everywhere now, because this is now a slightly old study, we did this about five years ago, was that the experiences were coming to the fore. 
and a number of tech offerings were beginning to stop trying to sell in their stores, but instead embed you in what your experience would be like at home. In fact, um, the Samsung 360 store in New York was very good at this. You can't even buy a Samsung product there. But it is a little bit like going to your home. You sit on the sofa, they let you play on the devices and you get to feel like, what would my life be like if I had more Samsung in it? Um, so it actually uh, proved this piece of research that the Apple model was trailing behind and become more of the dominant model. But the emergent experiential innovations were all about um, making you feel like you could um, integrate the brand into your life. So we were able to explain to this client how they could uh, create new and different experiences. But again, not asking the consumer uh, was one of our big ahas. You know, they gave us all of that old research, which kept on saying Apple, 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 Apple. And they were like, well, we've tried to do Apple and they still complain it's not as good as Apple. And so the other big tip there is you need to create your own unique experience. Don't try and copy because it never works because people don't notice you. They only notice you when you break out of the status quo, create a new zeitgeist. Now, there's a whole, the, 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 there's a lot of complexity and considerations to, to innovation. And, you know, our clients are all striving to, to, to bring out the best platforms, services, products, etc. What's the, what's the smallest taste? What's, what's the easiest way for them to get a taste of how, how you could potentially help them and, and your agency can, you know, can, can help steer them in the right direction? Yeah, I think one of the most interesting and useful things that one can do really early on in a project um, is often two or three things we do off the bat. And you could just do this as like a baby stage one to whet your appetite and see if there's anything useful or interesting out there that you could do. One is doing um, a situation analysis report of what's going on out there in your category which is quite easy to do and quite quick to do. And second is a safari, a virtual safari to look, because we've been doing lots of virtual ones, obviously, in our lockdown world, but you can do it, you know, in, in, in person or virtually, at what the new science codes and symbols are that are emerging in your category, but also think about some of those faster moving categories that are slightly adjacent to you where they're thinking about how to use their tech um, in a slightly more novel and innovative way. And pretty much every book that's written on how to be creative says that you need to do multiple dimensions of thinking and you pull in experience and innovation and thought um, from every angle you can think of, no stone unturned. And that would be my top tip, to just do an initial audit of what's going on out there and a situation report, possibly with something we call a semiotic map, which is this beautiful, sexy diagram of the residual, which is the past, the dominant, which is the present, and the emergent, which is the emerging future, signs, codes and symbols, where all the brands sit and where you sit in relation to that. And that's often one of those magic moments where people go, ah, oh, but we could move here because this is really similar to us, but just a slightly more exciting version. Um, so, so that's often our sort of start of the 10. Let's see what our situation is like and where we can go from there. Well, that's fascinating. Amelia, thank you so much for, for you know, taking time out for a cuppa with me. And uh, all the very best with your, with your future innovations. <laughs> thank you very much. It's been lovely speaking to you, Andy. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Cheers.